and hello it is noon thank you so much for joining me today we're going to talk about the new vaccine the Johnson & Johnson corona vaccine there's not that much information out there I tried to get vaccine inserts for all of the vaccines the Moderna one the Pfizer one and this Johnson & Johnson one and they're just nowhere to be found so if you find them if you're able to get a hold of them, please let me know. So I'm just not able to find them. But this is what is put out by Johnson & Johnson itself. Okay, it's on their own website, and this is as recent as January the 5th. So that was last week, okay? And so it's talking about their development of the corona vaccine. And they make a lot of claims that they're very good at doing vaccines because they were able to do the Ebola virus uh, vaccine. And they use that same methodology and that same um, recipe, for lack of a better word, to work on this Corona-19 vaccine. So I tried to find out, and I didn't have that much time, to be honest with you, to find out how effective the Ebola vaccine was and so I didn't find really any percentage I know we don't hear a whole lot about the Ebola vaccine so I'm assuming that it was effective um, or maybe it's just not the vac you know the virus of uh, virus of the day and so nobody's really looking at that today so right so this is the thing the one thing I do like if I liked vaccines and I don't really like vaccines you know that if you've listened to my podcast if you've listened to my videos you know that I'm not a fan of vaccines why is that? Because of the adjuvants that are in vaccines, most vaccines. So I wanted to find out what actually was in the coronavirus vaccines, and it's just very difficult to find out any information. The thing I like about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as, a pair, uh, as opposed to the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does not use M. RNA technology, so it's not going to change your DNA. I also like it because it's only one dose at the moment, and I like it because it's cheaper. Why is it cheaper? Because it doesn't have to be at a below zero temperature uh, like the other vaccines have to be. So uh, there are some things, if I had to choose, if I had to get one, if I had to choose one, I probably would choose this one. Um, it's not even out of all of its trials yet, so I'm just saying, hypothetically, if I had to choose one, I might, I might choose this. So, one of the things that they say is that they have been working on this vaccine, and it is now in phase three clinical trials. The vaccine trial is called Ensemble, okay, and they have 45,000 uh, participants in this, okay. It says that they looked at the genome of the virus. Now, I had read before, and I know there are a lot of people out there that do research uh, as well. And so if you find something that I don't know, and I'm, I'm not saying I know it all for sure, but I had heard earlier on that people had gone to the CDC and they had said, please send me the complete genome of this corona virus, the new coronavirus 19, and the CDC said that they had not isolated this genome. Now, that's what I've heard. I went to the CDC, and the only thing I could find from the coronavirus is what they did in 2003 with the SARS coronavirus. Now, this COVID-19 is part of the SARS family, okay? So I don't know if they took that, and, and the PubMed does say that they did the complete genome on this. So I'm assuming that's what they're looking at, but I, I can't promise that that's what they're looking at. Anyway, Johnson & Johnson took 10 segments of the coronavirus, the new virus. I don't know why they only took 10 segments. You would think that they would wanna do uh, the full the full genome, but I couldn't find it, and maybe they couldn't find it either, and so that's, I'm just throwing that out there. It says, due to our extensive previous experience with vaccine, vaccine technology, we use the same technology to create our European Commission approved Ebola vaccine. Scientists already had good sense of the best dose to use 
for the investigational COVID-19 candidate. From there, they closely collaborated with a doctor and his team at the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliate of the Harvard Medical School, to design a large number of potential candidates for this vaccine, all right? Uh, they looked at their preclinical work with Zika and the HIV vaccine, okay? So they're looking at that. They spent more than $1 billion in the development of this vaccine. So from March until June, they experimented and they found the two, the, the two uh, strains of vaccine, I guess for lack of a better word, that they wanted to try with the population, okay? It says, it was possible in part because our discovery and manufacturing teams were able to execute several steps in parallel that they normally would be would have executed sequentially. Now this kind of bothers me because when you're doing your trials, you're doing phase one, you see what happens, you do phase two, you see what happens, and then you go on and you do phase three. Now the government, our government in particular with warp speed, they were able to give tons and tons of money to these vaccine developers and that did help them develop um, more quickly, what normally takes several years, they were able to do it more quickly. I don't know if that's a good thing. We don't know what the long-term side effects are, and this is what is very, very problematic with the vaccines. I received this morning, uh, and I have not looked at all these videos, there's like 40, 40, 40 video links with all these major doctors or household name doctors who are saying vaccines are not effective and we don't recommend them. So I'm gonna have some time to look at this and I'll pass on the best of the best to you. But this is one of the things when you're talking to medical doctors and they're saying vaccines are neither safe nor effective, that makes me pause, okay? So, it says, once we had some strong interim data, we were able to move into phase three clinical trials with a chosen dose. Phase three, during phase three, many more people received the vaccine to thoroughly test safety and efficacy. The more people who can be vaccinated at this point, the sooner researchers can gather conclusive results. So they're doing this interview and they're asking what is or how how is the research going and they're saying that it's going great, that they're moving into their phase three. It says that the trial is now fully enrolled with roughly 45,000 adult participants. In fact, Ensemble is the fastest enrolled trial in Johnson & Johnson history. We secured these uh, participants in less than four months. So that's a, that's a lot of participants, okay? It says that they went across all backgrounds, they went across all age groups, all um, ethnicities, and all that kind of stuff. It says while diversity is important in all of our research at Johnson & Johnson, it is especially crucial for the investigational COVID-19 vaccine because the virus disproportionately affects blacks and Latino communities. So, you knew that, we've talked about that, don't really know why that is, okay? So nobody really knows, but they're, they're making sure that they test these people as well. The study protocols include a 14-day and a 28-day endpoint. Endpoints are the primary outcomes being measured by the clinical trial, like physical symptoms or test results showing protection against the disease. Johnson Johnson says that our expectation is that full immunity is reached after day 28, but we may see some protection as early as 14 days. Now, immunity, this is a key word, in your Pfizer, and your Moderna vaccines, they're not looking for immunity. They're looking for mitigation of symptoms, all right? So in real down-to-earth language, that means the vaccine, the ones that we have, the Moderna one and the Pfizer one, are not going to keep you from getting the coronavirus. 
all they're going to do is make the symptoms less severe, if anything. That's, that's what they've said in their software, in their software, in their press releases, okay? This one says that they're looking for immunity. Now, immunity means I get the vaccine, I'm not going to get the virus. That's, that's what they're hoping for, okay? Um, so, uh, they're also studying a two-dose regimen. They're seeing, it's called Ensemble 2, and they're seeing if giving a two-dose, a second dose, two months after the first dose, if that enhances the immunity, if that makes it, uh, that your immunity lasts longer, if that gives you a longer protection, okay? It says that they are looking for a 90% success rate, and they don't know what it is because they're just now in phase three, but that's what they're looking for. It says, we do have long-term safety data for our vaccine platform. More than 140,000 people have received vaccines and vaccine candidates using that platform. We feel very confident in our one-dose regimen since we spent so much time and effort in zeroing in on one specific antigen we were able to optimize it and make it as strong as possible. And this is what I really like about this particular vaccine. Unlike the mRNA vaccines, which uses the messenger RNA to create a protein that prompts an immune response in the body, our investigational COVID-19 vaccine uses an adenovirus, a type of virus that causes the common cold and it has been made unable to replicate. So they've taken this adenovirus and they have sterilized it so it cannot by itself replicate in the body. So I like that, okay? Because if it's not a live virus, it's not gonna shed and that kind of thing. And that's, what, that's exactly what we want. The adenovirus carries a gene from the coronavirus into human cells which then produces the coronavirus spike protein, but not the coronavirus itself. This spike protein is what primes the immune system to fight off subsequent infection by the virus. Now, I want you to kind of take a little notepad and write down immune priming because we're gonna to go to another report that talks about priming the immune system. Now, in this Johnson & Johnson report, they're saying we're giving you a sterilized uh, adenovirus that cannot replicate, but it should cause your immune system to recognize a spike protein virus, and you should make antibodies against that virus. If that does in fact happen, it is my understanding that that would produce immunity. This is what happens in a wild virus, something that's out there that comes into my field, right? that wild virus will uh, come into my system, my body will respond against that, my body will make antibodies against that, and anytime in the future that that wild virus comes into my field, okay, I breathe it in, I touch it, I taste it, whatever, my body's gonna go, no, 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 we know what that is, and we are, are immune to that because we already have the antibodies there. That is the way the immune system works, in my understanding, okay, with a wild virus. So, they have advantages, and they're talking about their advantage of the, uh, not only the one dose, but the way they make it, it also uh, does not have to be refrigerated below uh, minus four degrees Fahrenheit. The other viruses, I think, and somebody's probably gonna fact check me on this, but I think they have to be refrigerated at minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This one, just you put it in your refrigerator and you'll be just fine. It will uh, be effective for at least uh, two years at minus four degrees and it's effective or it, it will be alive, alive or uh, it's not alive because I just told you that. It will be uh, potent for at least three months at minus 35 to minus 46 degrees, which is the temperature of your refrigerator, okay? It may be stable for even longer than that. They don't really know. We believe that the stability will help make it easier to transport and distribute 
to the vaccine candidates without the need for shipping in special temperature or special containers, which of course makes everything much more expensive. Once we receive the efficacy and safety data from our phase three study, which should come in later this month, we're looking for very specific endpoints. Later this month would be this month, January 2021. Our endpoint end looks at whether our investigational vaccine presents prevents someone from getting sick with moderate to severe COVID-19, meaning that they show at least two symptoms, such as a fever or a cough, as well as if the person has a positive PCR test, which detects the virus genetic material. We measure this at different endpoints to see what when the protection will kick in. Now, if you've been uh, watching us, if you've been listening to what we've been talking about, about the coronavirus and the PCR testing, you know that the cycles per uh, threshold is like 40. Uh, many doctors will say that that's why you get a lot of false positives is because the cycle threshold is so large. And to be really, really truthful about the uh, presence of the virus that you would need to have about uh, 25 to 27 cycle thresholds. So just going to throw that out there, okay? Um, it says that we're hoping that the milestones will come together by the end of February, and then we can, sit, can consider applying for the emergency use authorization for the vaccine from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Now, I think this is really interesting because they started working on this in January and they're still not even close. They still are two months out, a month and a half out of uh, obtaining that emergency use. If I had to pick a vaccine, I would probably pick this one because there is no MNRA technology, okay? And we talked about that before. Now, I'm gonna move into a different report now and this report says, ask the question rather, does getting the flu vaccine affect COVID-19? Now, I don't know about where you are, but where we are, we're in um, January. So winter really just is just setting in here in uh, the Houston, Texas area. And they are, we showed in Texas a spike in the coronaviruses in the fall. So what happens in the fall? What happens in the fall, kids go back to school and everybody starts pushing the flu vaccine because it is flu season. There's really no such thing as flu season. I'm just gonna throw that out there. But that's what the uh, all of the talking heads are talking about. And so everybody who believes that, okay, and that, that's what you believe and that's fine, uh, if you went out and received your annual flu vaccine, then this report is saying that there could be a very huge correlation between the uh, vaccine and COVID-19, and there may even be causation. So we kind of want to talk about this. This is written by a medical doctor, and it says, for years, concerns have been raised that the previous flu vaccinations seemed to increase patients' risk of contracting a more serious pandemic illness. This occurred during the 2008-2009 flu season when prior vaccines with the seasonal flu vaccine were associated with increased risk of H1N1, the swine flu, during the summer of 2009 in Canada. Okay, a January 2020, so this last year, study published in the journal Vaccine also found people were more likely to get some form of coronavirus infection if they had been vaccinated against influenza during the 2017 and 2018 flu season. Compared with unvaccinated individuals, those who had received the seasonal flu shots were 36% more likely to contract the unspecified coronavirus infection. It did not specifically mention COVID-19, but it was a COVID virus, okay? And 51% more likely to contract, and I'm gonna get this word all messed up so y'all forgive me, 
human meta pneumonia virus infection okay and it has symptoms very similar to COVID-19 so if you were vaccinated you had a 36 percent more chance of getting a COVID virus you had a 50 uh, one percent more likely to get this human meta pneumonia virus infection all right I would assume that's some kind of viral pneumonia just gonna throw that out there in October 2020, they found another positive association between COVID-19 deaths and flu vaccination rates in the elderly, further raising questions about the potentially serious unintended side effects of the flu shots. All right. Uh, Christian Winkle. I don't know if I got that right or not. Professor of Genetics at the uh, University of Juarez in Durango analyzed data from 39 countries with more than one half of a million inhabitants, right? He expected to find that the flu vaccine would be linked to lower COVID-19 death risk, but instead he found that the data revealed the opposite. Among people aged 65 and older, flu vaccination was positively associated with COVID-19 deaths, meaning those who got a flu vaccine were more likely to die from COVID-19. And this is a quote, contrary to expectations, the present worldwide analysis and European sub-analysis do not support the previously reported negative association between COVID-19 deaths and influenza vaccination rate in elderly people. A May 2020 analysis by a publication found that European countries with the highest COVID-19 death rates also had the highest rates of flu vaccine, at least 50% of the elderly, okay? Denmark and Germany with lower use of the flu vaccine had considerably lower COVID-19 mortality. So this is important. Uh, you want to, I'm going to post this and you guys can look at that and look at this research. There's all kinds of links in here. I don't have time to go through all of this, but I want to give you this information and then you can make your, um, you can make your informed decision everywhere on the media get your flu shot, get your flu shot, get your flu shot. Why? Okay. What is that going to do with this COVID-19 virus that is going around? I do believe there is a COVID-19 virus. I do. Um, however, the mortality rate is not anywhere near what they thought it was. I don't have the statistics on my computer, but I have seen the statistics that say that the cumulative death rate for 2020, so all of 2020 was less than the cumulative death rate in 2019, and it was less than the cumulative death rate in 2018. So it makes me wonder when our media has been saying, pandemic, 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 the sky is falling, everybody's dying, why we have fewer deaths 2020 with this horrible pandemic than we had in 2019 or 2018. Not saying that those of you who have been affected, those of you who have lost family members, I'm not saying that that's not important. It is important, but you've got to look at the overall data. All right. So they attempted, these researchers attempted to update their figures in the fall of 2020. They were able to update their COVID-19 mortality rates but did not obtain current vaccination data. Spikes in COVID-19 deaths were noted, which they suggested could relate to the sudden uptick in the flu vaccination in the countries that had previously had lower vaccination rates. And this is a quote. The increased COVID-19 deaths could simply be due to the virus reaching epidemic levels later in Eastern Europe, but the other factor could be the sudden increase of the flu vaccine in countries 
of hitherto low uptake? Are they unwittingly endangering our seniors? Now, I just want to be really, really clear here. I don't think anybody is trying to hurt people on purpose, okay? I don't think that at all. I would hope that people are just more generous than that. I hope they're more loving than that. But I am the um, advocate. I'm the advocate of my own health. It is not up to you to keep me healthy. It is up to me to keep me healthy. I am the only one that knows what assaults my immune system has been subjected to. I'm the only one that knows how many medications I'm on. I'm the only one that knows any of that kind of thing. By the way, I'm on no medications and my blood work is perfect, so I think I'm in pretty good shape. I did the DNA hair analysis and it showed that my immunity is very good, my gut health is very good. And that's really what you wanna do. That's really what you wanna understand going forward because your immune system is the only thing that's going to help you stay well. Thank God we've got doctors. Thank God we've got hospitals for people that have an adverse reaction. Um, but that is going to get you out of trouble. That's not going to keep you well. What keeps you well is a strong immune system. And so that's what we want. Here is a graph. I'm going to put it in the... Uh, in the comments, I'm going to put this in the comments so you can look at it. It shows the clear uh, data of a rise in vaccinations equating to a rise in coronavirus. So you just have to look at that, all right? Um, they don't know if it is causative. It definitely is uh, a factor there, okay? It says it's a controversial finding, which if proven to be causative would call into question the annual flu vaccination. The publisher's note at the top reminds the readers that correlation does not necessarily mean causation, and that is true, um, but if something is going to uh, hurt my immune system, and uh, we want to look at, uh, let me see, where is this word? Pathogenic priming. Okay, remember I told you to look at that. What is pathogenic priming? This is a scenario in which rather than enhancing your immunity against infection, exposure to a virus or vaccine enhances the virus's ability to enter and infect your cells, resulting in more severe diseases. So I would really like to do an impromptu survey if you know and you, will, you can tell me. If you have been affected by COVID-19, do you take the annual flu shot? I just want to know. If you've had somebody who, have, who has died from the COVID-19, did they take the annual flu shot? I just want to know if that is a factor um, because it could be a factor. And the more information that we know, then the better, the better we'll be able to understand that. It is right. Um, it says research published in the Journal of Translational Autoimmunity confirmed that treatment with a vaccine may increase the risks associated with a wild type virus rather than to protect against it. And concluded, as the title suggests, pathogenic priming likely contributes to serious and critical illness and mortality of the COVID-19 via autoimmunity. Now, what is autoimmunity? Autoimmunity is when your immune system gets confused and it starts attacking your own tissues. And it also is when the immune system gets on really, really high alert and you have your cytokine storm. We've talked about that in other videos. My time is running out. I don't wanna go over that right now, but you can definitely go back and look at our videos and you can see that. The Journal of Translational Autoimmunity, okay, authored by James Lyons Wheeler with the Institute for Pure and Applied Knowledge, a nonprofit organization that performs scientific research in the public interest, explains how pathogenic priming occurred during previous trials of a SARS coronavirus vaccine. Now remember, why do we not have the annual coronavirus vaccine? Not, not 19, 
but previous because the SARS coronavirus came in in 2003, I think it was. Why do we not have that annual vaccine? Well, I'm going to tell you why. The SARS type of priming of the immune system was observed during animal studies of the SARS spike protein-based vaccines leading to increased morbidity, that means death, and mortality, well that means death, morbidity, sickness, and death, okay, in vaccinated animals that were subs subsequently exposed to the wild SARS virus. Sorry, my pages are messed up. The problem highlighted in the two studies became obvious following post-vaccination challenge with the SARS virus. Recumbent SARS spike protein-based vaccines not only failed to provide protection from the SARS COVID infection, but also that the mice experienced increased immunopathology with eosinophilic inf infiltrates in their lungs. So what this means is if they had the virus to pro uh, the vaccine to protect them from the virus when they were coming into contact with the wild virus they had even a more severe reaction and even death okay similarly ferrets previously vaccinated against SARS COVID also developed a strong inflammatory response in the liver tissues hepatitis both studies suspected a cellular immune response. Quote, these types of unfortunate outcomes are sometimes referred to as immune enhancement, and we did a whole video on that um, a few weeks ago. However, it is nearly, it is nearly a euphemistic phrase that fails to convey the increased risk of illness and death due to prior exposure to the SARS spike protein. For this reason, I refer to the concept as pathogenic priming. Now remember, a few weeks ago we did immune enhancement. And that sounds good. I want my immune system to be enhanced. Words matter. I think that's what the name of the video was called, was Words Matter. So. He's saying we don't want to call it immune enhancement, we want to call it pathogenic priming. Early tests, uh, okay, this is early tests from Dr. Uh, Peter Hotez. Now, we see him all the time in Houston. He's at the Baylor College of Medicine. He is someone who has a lot of experience with viruses, and this is a quote from him, okay? It says, in early tests of his candidate, he witnessed, this is Dr. Hotez, how immune cells of vaccinated animals attacked lung tissue much in the same way that the RSV vaccine had resulted in immune cells attacking kids' lungs. This is a quote. I thought, oh crap. <laughs> That's really not something that you want to hear professional people say, but that was a direct quote. He recalls, noting his initial fear that a safe vaccine may again not be possible. All right. In December 2020, NBC News in Chicago reported the death of an 18-year-old girl from Illinois who died from COVID-19 just three days after three days of being hospitalized. All right. I think she did have the flu shot right before she got this infection. All right. COVID-19 survival rate from newborns to 19 is 99.997% recovery rate, according to data from the CDC. It's heartbreaking that this loss, all right, it needs to have an increased investigation into why a previously healthy teenager died so unexpectedly from a virus that is rarely dangerous in that age group. In the interview, her mother stated that she had just received her flu shot. All right, so just giving you information, I want you to have all of what you need to make the best choice for your body, for your family, for your children. All right, this is for informational purposes. 
I know what I'm gonna do, I know what my family's going to do. You've gotta take this information. I'll post these links in the comment box so you can do your research. I've got another um, PubMed article on the SARS coronavirus back in 2003 and how the uh, CDC was able to uh, do their whole genome. I was gonna talk to you about the Cox postulate, but I don't have time to do that. There's a lot of controversy out there. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting, you know, just conflicting uh, information. Some people will say, well, this is a virus, so that doesn't matter. But if you look at this PubMed article that I'm gonna post, they used his postulates to do the entire genome sequence for the SARS uh, coronavirus back in 2003, I think it was. So lots of information. You've got to do what's best for you. I love you. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and thank you for commenting. So if you need any information, if there's something that you are particularly interested in, then let me know. And we will try and get that information to you. It's the weekend. Have some really, really good downtime. Do some self-care, whether that means getting your nails done, getting your hair done, have a massage, go fishing with the kids, whatever it means. Enjoy your weekend, and I will see you next week.